Professor, I had a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, in the email that you sent out on Friday, it still had the due date from the fall. It's due this Friday, right? The homework? Yes. Yeah, it should be due this Friday. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think it still said like October something. Okay, I, I probably forgot to change the, the fall. Yeah, I should go and change that. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. You're welcome. Okay, we are almost there. I guess we get we can get started. Uh, before we get started, uh, do you have any questions? I think Michael Williams asked a question. So if any one of you has a question, you can ask now before we get started. That was Hayden. What? Somebody say something? Uh, oh, yeah, that was That was, that that was Hayden that asked the question. Oh, Hayden. Okay, sorry. Um, can you hear me? I have a new mic today. Yeah, you sound good. Okay, good. Um, can you see my screen? Hello, can you all see my yes. screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So today I'm going to talk about circuit theory. Circuit theory is something that you learn as an electrical engineer very early in your career. But now that you have learned electromagnetic theory, Maxwell's equations and so on, uh, we like to visit circuit theory again because we can think of circuit theory as a subset of electromagnetic theory if you want to think of it that way. Electromagnetic theory is more powerful. Uh, it operates and it can be used from DC to optics. Whereas circuit theory is usually used in very low frequency circuits as well as uh, microwave engineering. And maybe eventually it could be used um, in optics if you have nano fabrication. Uh, circuit theory is valid when the low frequency version of Maxwell's equations can be used. And that we have learned before and that is true when the size of the object is much, much smaller than the wavelength. And that is certainly true in RF circuit uh, in the megahertz and kilohertz range. And in microwave engineering, if you are able to fabricate devices that are very small compared to wavelength, you can use circuit theory to describe many of the physics in microwave engineering. Perhaps one day in optical engineering, if nano fabrication becomes easily available. Uh, this is what you see inside a computer board. Okay, you can see the inside of the computer board. Uh, there are lots of components. You can have a chip, you can have different kinds of things. I don't know if I can identify all of these components. Some of them are capacitors, some of them are inductors. Uh, the important thing is that they are usually planar and you can lay them out uh, on a board, a printed circuit board. And inside the chip, if you were to break it up, you will see many circuit components in there as well. So IC design, okay, IC design, IC stands for integrated circuit. IC design is a blooming industry uh, in the sense that uh, that industry can hire uh, many electrical engineers. Okay, so let's revisit circuit theory and start with the uh, Kirchhoff current law. Kirchhoff current law, again, I guess all of us know what it is. You can actually derive this law from Maxwell's equations. Uh, you can start with say Ampere's law, which says that this is true. And if you take the divergence of this equation, you get the right-hand side to be zero, and then you get that uh, this being the truth in the next line, but then you impose Gauss law or Coulomb's law, if you wish to call it that way, then you essentially have the fact that um, partial partial T of 
row is equal to divergence of J, which is the continuity equation. And this is essentially a statement of charge conservation. The statement of charge conservation because it says divergence of J is a measure of how current is oozing out from a point. If you ask for the physical meaning of divergence of J, it is a measure of, say, if you have current flowing continuously as a function of space. And if you take divergence of that point, you're essentially measuring how much current is coming out of that point. Okay, and it says that that oozing of current out from that point is proportional to the rate of change of the charge density. What it says is that if the charge density is decreasing, which makes this the rho dt a negative number, then minus the rho dt will become a positive number. And what it says is that when this is equal to that, okay, then the divergence of J is positive. Okay, for this picture that we've drawn divergence of J is positive. It means that the current is oozing out from that point in space. And we can convert this into a more global picture uh, by, for instance, uh, use uh, Gauss divergence theorem. We can integrate this divergence of J over a certain V and that V, we can take it to be that V inside there, and that V is bounded by a surface S. Okay, and then we will have D. Uh, I can just do a shortcut to be rho dV over that V. Okay, so when you integrate uh, the charge continuity equation, you get that. In the left-hand side, you can apply Gauss divergence theorem and say that this is N dot uh, J dS is equal to minus D dt of Q, the total charge, okay? The total charge being inside the volume V and when the frequency is slow, you can say that this is approximately equal to zero, okay? When the frequency is very low. So in circuit theory, when you always assume that the frequency is low enough, so that d dt, which actually becomes minus j omega or plus j omega in a notation, uh, terms involving j omega can be dropped. And hence you have this fact that uh, if you were to apply this law, okay, you can easily show that this integration, and if you evaluate this n dot j, ds on each of the surfaces where currents are going into this volume V, you will arrive at the fact that um, I1 plus I2 plus I3 uh, plus I sub n must be zero. <coughs> this is just a statement of KCL, okay? KCL and you can rewrite it as uh, sum of I sub I, I is equal to one to N to be zero, okay? So are there any questions on KCL or Kikov current law? These laws were actually discovered and worked upon uh, before Maxwell's equations came about, okay? But they're very intuitive. Uh, if you look at them, uh, you can actually can arrive at them uh, using physical motivation and arrive at these laws uh, very intuitively. Okay. The second law that I like to talk about is the Kirchhoff voltage law. Okay, Kirchhoff voltage law says that the sum of voltages in a closed loop uh, must be zero. And this law actually comes from, um, well, it comes from uh, Faraday's law that if I have 
Faraday's law being this. And I'm also going to assume that the frequency is very low. So variation with respect to time is going to be very small. And if that is the case, then I can say Faraday's law says that uh, curl of E must be equal to zero. And this means that E can be expressed as a gradient of a potential. Okay, E must be proportional to the gradient of a potential. Um, then this equation is automatically satisfied. Then you can show that you can rewrite this equation using uh, Stokes theorem and say is that the left-hand side is just essentially equal to E dot dl on a closed loop and that should be equal to zero approximately when the frequency tends to zero, okay? And then this is a law that you can uh, state quite easily, but um, you can use the fact that because of the fact that E is the gradient of phi, then E dot dl between any two points A and B can be written as uh, minus gradient of phi dot dl between A and B, okay? And this is something that you do not encounter in an undergraduate course, but you can think of this being an integration on a line. And if you put this integration on a the line, then this would be just minus uh, phi because you can integrate this as closed form because this is an exact derivative on a the line. Then you can put this to be equal to that and that is just equal to minus phi b plus phi a. Okay, you can work this out, that would be equal to that. And what it says is that E dot dl, the integration between two points A and B would be just equal to phi B minus phi A. And you can actually calculate this voltage drops uh, across the loop on all these resistors. I can move this slightly above, maybe it'll give me more space. Um, Okay, so, so you can actually calculate these voltage drops across these resistors. And as a mnemonic, uh, when the current flows, when the current flows in the resistor, uh, the resistor actually impedes current flow due to collision. The electrons will collide with the lattice of the material and the electrons are slowed down because the electrons are slowed down. You can think that uh, it is not easy for the electron to have an easy passage through this resistor. So charge will accumulate on this side and then charge will be depleted from the other side as the current flows. And because of that, electric field always goes from positive charges to negative charges. That's something that you learn in your undergraduate days. And if that is the case, then if this point, if I call this um, A, this point B, uh, what it says is that uh, phi A, did I use uh, A and B correctly in my lecture notes? Let me just check. Okay, I think in the lecture notes, I might have, um, yeah, it doesn't matter. I can use this picture. Okay, phi A is larger than phi B in this picture. Okay, because electric field always points from a place of higher potential to a place of lower potential. And because phi A is larger than phi B, then phi B minus phi A is negative. Okay, phi A minus phi B is negative or phi B minus phi A is negative. And hence you say that there's a voltage drop. So if you were to subtract the voltage at these two nodes, you get a negative number. And this is something that you have learned as an undergraduate course. And you can see that 
the sum of these voltages would add up to zero. Uh, that means that if all these voltage drops are negative, uh, it means that the voltage drop here must be positive because what you need to have is that sum of voltages, sum of voltages add up to zero. So one of them must be positive, which means that in the source region, the the electric field actually points in opposite direction. So if you were to look at the electric field inside a battery, okay, so all the voltage drops add to zero, which means that the voltage drop must be positive inside the source region. And that can only be possible if the electric field points in the opposite direction to the current flow. Okay, so if the current is flowing in this direction, then if you do E dot dL, uh, say between two points in the voltage source region, you'll find that it has a positive number and the other voltage drops are all negative. And then you will have Kirchhoff voltage law being satisfied, which is that this has to be true. So because of this concept, then you can think of the fact that the electric field will be pointing in the opposite direction when you apply a current. And it is not the same as the resistor. We can say that a battery is equivalent to a negative resistor. Okay, you can think of it that way. And in fact, uh, this concept of negative resistance as a power source, if you have a negative resistance, it generates energy or energy source it has been used in transistor physics to explain some of the transistor behavior at very high frequency. And some, so there's a guy by the name of Leo Isaki. Okay. He came up with this concept of negative resistance. And he was awarded the Nobel Prize for coming up with this concept. Just a side note that you might find interesting. Okay. So are there any questions uh, regarding kickoff voltage law? If not, then let's look at a circuit that has resistors, battery, a voltage source, an inductor, as well as a capacitor. Okay. So we can solve this problem. Um, and we can actually apply Faraday's law to this problem. And then you will have this being the case. And what you have then is that when you convert this to integral form using Stokes theorem, you will have that this should be equal to minus uh, DDT of B dot DS B dot the S being the flux linkage caused by the inductor. Okay. And that we are going to take the loop C to be this loop over here. Okay. And then uh, you can see that uh, B is approximately zero inside this loop. because there are no solenoids or inductors to generate a very strong magnetic field. So we can essentially say that if I were to take a C that is something like that, then I would essentially have this to be equal to zero, okay? Then I can apply Faraday's law to this loop and say that, um, well, V zero, plus VCB VCB is the voltage uh, I would define VCB as been VC minus VB okay so since VB is higher than VC in potential so this is a negative number so if I add this voltage it is actually a negative number. And then if I look at the voltage drop between these two, if I assume an electric field between these two points, 
I can add a VCD between point C and point D. Again, if the electric field is such that uh, this is higher potential than this, so that the electric field will look like this. And here again, as I said before, inside the resistor, the electric field looks something like this. And this also will make VCD to be a negative number. And then uh, VCB, uh, VCB, uh, VCD, VDC, okay, VDC uh, plus V uh, AD to be zero. And all this would have to be negative numbers. Okay, all this would be, have to be negative numbers. And then uh, when you work things out, uh, everything works out to be correct because you assume that E is minus grad phi. And then uh, J omega, this term that you should have in Maxwell's equation is assumed to be zero. That means that there's no induction term. And A usually comes from the magnetic field. You can easily show that VCB uh, is, as I say, VC minus VB and then VDC is VD minus VC, and then VAD is VA minus VD. And all these are negative numbers. Uh, V0 is of course a positive number because it is uh, driven by a voltage source. So we apply Faraday's law by assuming that there's no magnetic flux linkage. However, when you look for the voltage drop here, the reason why you can have a voltage drop there, even though this is a piece of wire, let's assume that this is a PEC wire. There's no electric field inside the wire, and yet there's a voltage drop here. Uh, the reason that we have a voltage drop is because of magnetic field linkage or flux linkage. And that is shown by this picture over here. So you have a voltage drop across an inductor uh, even though the inductor is made of, say, a perfect electric conductor. So if you think of this being a perfect electric conductor, then E should be zero inside this conductor. And uh, if you do E dot dL, if you naively do E dot dL over, uh, say, C to D, inside this, uh, this, this loop, okay? you will find that that is equal to zero, okay? However, if you were to do the loop such that uh, this loop is C prime, okay, the, I'm going to define a loop C prime that goes like this. It goes from D to C. Okay, that is my C prime loop. And I can unwrap the inductor saying that each loop that it has, has a flux linkage of a certain amount, because when this is an inductor, uh, there will be magnetic field going through the inductor in this manner. Uh, I'm not going to count the flux linkage loop by loop, but to make things simpler, I unwrap the inductor loop into a bigger loop, okay? So my C prime will consist of this loop. because it consists of this loop, uh, it actually has a non-zero right-hand side now. Okay, if I look at this now, this is uh, d dt of d dot dA, or ds, as we often say in this course, over the area enclosed by this loop C prime, and that is not zero. Okay, that is not zero now. So we cannot throw out the right-hand side if we draw our loop to be such. Whereas previously, uh, we could throw out the flux linkage term because there's no magnetic field in this loop. So if you work this out, well, you will find that uh, you can now define an inductor. Okay, you can define an inductor such that uh, the, it's proportional to the flux linkage. The flux linkage is something that is proportional to the inductor times the current and that is B dot D 
ES. Okay. <coughs> that is my flux linkage. And I know that uh, the left hand side is just uh, ECD. Okay. Left hand side is the voltage between uh, VCD. Okay. That is the left hand side. And because of that, then um, let me see. I actually use the notation uh, VCD for the left hand side. And then, um, but the left hand side is an integral on a closed loop, but E is equal to zero inside PEC. Let's assume that this wire is made of. PEC. So E is zero inside this loop. The only place where E is not zero is in the air region here. Assuming that there'll be a charge accumulation as you push the current through this inductor, uh, just like a resistor, the inductor will resist the flow of current so that there will be charge accumulation on this side of the inductor tip or the, the, the output port, and then there will be positive charges accumulating there, and then there'll be negative charges on the other side of the tip, okay? So there'll be electric field like this outside the inductor loop. And if you were to calculate the left-hand side, it will only pick up non-zero values in this gap, in this gap region, okay? And you can look at that, that is actually VCD and you have a minus sign here. Finally, you have the fact that uh, VDC, which is minus VCD is the same as the flux linkage. Okay, which is the same as L the IDT. Okay, you can work that out from this equation and that is the law of the inductor or the IV relationship for an inductor, okay? Are there any questions regarding how we arrive at this inductor formula? The description in, given in uh, Ramo is wrong, okay? If you go and read Ramo, he actually gives the wrong accounting, the wrong accounting of this inductor effect, okay? But believe me, what I have in my lecture note is correct. So we have done one element. Uh, so let's look at the other element that is very important in circuit theory, which is the capacitor. The capacitor is a charge storage device. And so if you were to apply a voltage V across this thing, uh, the, the charge Q between the capacitor is essentially proportional to the voltage that you apply. Okay, it would be uh, something like this. So the capacitor is a constant that reflects the capacity of a parallel plate to store charges. The higher the capacitor is, uh, the more charge will be stored in, put in between these two parallel plates. Okay, and you can arrive at the voltage current relationship for a capacitor quite easily by seeing that I would be equal to the QDT by charge conservation. You can apply the continuity equation to the left plate. And this equation can easily be gotten from this equation. Okay, you use the charge continuity equation to arrive at this. And then of course you can say that uh, you now have an equation that says that uh, if you look at this equation now, uh, the QDT, okay, you differentiate this equation to say CDV dt is the QDT, which is equal to I, okay? So you have this uh, very nice uh, relationship for a capacitor that we have learned uh, in our undergraduate days, which is just this. 
Okay. Are there any questions as to how we arrive at this relationship? So, um, so the important thing to notice is that uh, when we have circuit theory, we say that, well, um, we have Faraday's law, which is this one. And then we have Ampere's law, which is this one. Okay, and we say that, well, uh, we're going to make things very simple in circuit theory with uh, dropping terms in these laws so that things can be greatly simplified. And from this law, we get kickoff voltage law. And from this law, if you take this divergence, we will get current continuity equation, which is this one over here. We have to use Gauss law to do that. And these two equations gave us kickoff current law. Okay. And you might think that, well, kickoff current law and kickoff voltage law are less powerful than Maxwell's equations. Uh, that is a misconception. You will think that, well, when I do circuit theory, I have to set this to be zero. And when I do circuit theory, I have to set this to be equal to that. Essentially, I have to assume that all these terms involving partial partial t are approximately equal to zero. However, what we have done in circuit theory and engineers are very clever, we actually try to retain the physics of this term. And we try to re uh, replace or retain the physics of that term by using clever devices. Okay, like the BDT is not equal to zero with inductor. Okay, and then DT DT can be made not equal to zero with capacitors. So if you look at circuit theory, we actually have not dropped any terms in Maxwell's equations. We have made Maxwell's equations simpler, but the flux linkage effect is still there. And the displacement current term, this is usually called the displacement current term, is still there, okay? That means that wave phenomenon is not destroyed or completely removed in circuit theory. And that is actually indicated by by the fact that uh, with circuit theory, we can do something like a uh, lambda element model. Okay, we went through this in the early part of transmission line theory. We use uh, capacitors and inductors connected uh, in series or concatenated in a certain fashion. And then we came up with uh, uh, V is good to L, the IDT with a minus sign perhaps, and then uh, V and then I is equal to C uh, dv dt. I think I'm correct about this, okay? So we come up with these two equations, which are telegraphers equation, and in the frequency domain, it would be like V is equal to um, minus J omega. Uh, sorry, I sh should have a, a dz here. Okay, uh, dv dz. or V is J omega Li, and then we have DZ I is good to J omega CV. Okay, those are called the telegraphers equations.
you can see that from the telegraphist equation, uh, we can still get wave phenomenon, which means that uh, I can easily eliminate uh, space depend or time dependence or omega dependence from this equation and show that d square dz square v uh, plus omega square LCV is equal to zero. And then I can easily show that d square dz square uh, I plus omega square LCI is equal to zero. And then we come up with the fact that the velocity of a wave that propagates on such a structure is one over LC. And these are the line inductors. So this inductance that we have there are looking something like this. And then this is C delta Z, okay? So the important thing to notice here is that wave phenomenon is not destroyed by simplifying things to become like circuit theory. What is more important is that you can actually have more engineering capability by using lumped element model. What it says is that if I make my inductors very large, if I make my capacitor very small, then I can actually make this velocity of the wave on, this is C naught, okay? This is the velocity of light. Maybe I should write it something like this. I can make the wave on a lumped element model to be much, much smaller than the speed of light in air or in vacuum. And you can arrive at something called slow wave structure. you can arrive at something called slow wave structure. So if you have a slow wave structure, what is the advantage of having a slow wave structure? Does anybody know? So if you have a wave that propagates very slowly, does the wave increase or decrease? Does one have a longer wave on a slow wave structure or a shorter wavelength? Does one have a longer wavelength on a slow wave structure or does one have a shorter wavelength on a slow wave structure? It would have a long wavelength. Uh, who say that please? Michael. Michael. Uh, yeah, it turns out that the, the answer is not correct. Okay, so the other one must be the correct answer. The slower the wave, the shorter the wavelength. So if you have problem remembering this, now let's assume that you have a dielectric material like glass. The velocity of light in a piece of glass has to become smaller so that we have refraction at the interface. So anything that we have slows the light velocity down, okay? so. Slow wave, wavelength means uh, slower light. Uh, what is the length of a wave inside a piece of glass compared to that in air? Does the wavelength of light in glass become shorter or longer? It becomes shorter, right? So whenever we have the slowing down of the velocity of light, the wave becomes the wavelength becomes shorter, okay? That is a very common rule of thumb that you have to take away from this course. The slower the wave is, the shorter the wavelength because I can derive that, uh, well, a beta, sometimes called K in optics, is two pi over lambda is omega over V, okay? Which means that lambda is uh, two pi V over omega, right? So the smaller V is, the shorter the wavelength. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength as well. So when you have a slow wave structure, you can have shorter wavelengths. <coughs> what is the advantage of having a shorter wavelength? Does anybody know? Can, can somebody think of a positive advantage 
of having a shorter wavelength. So you go back to your experience with uh, microwave waveguides and microwave resonators. You realize that in order for a microwave waveguide, like a rectangular waveguide to guide a wave, what is the size of the waveguide in order for the wave to be guided? Approximately, if you were to think of this heuristically, does the size of the waveguide have to be on the order of wavelengths or does it have to be much, much smaller than the wavelength. I'm just talking about rectangular waveguides and circular waveguides. What is the size of the waveguide compared to the size of the wavelength if you were to guide the wave? It has to be approximately lambda over two. Okay, sometimes uh, several lambdas, depending on if you want to guide higher order modes. So the good thing about having a slow wave structure is that you can make things smaller. Like you have learned in your uh, studying of resonators that in order for the wave to bounce around inside a cavity, the cavity size must at least be of the order of half a wavelength, which means that engineering a resonator is quite cumbersome. If you want to make a resonator say in RF frequency, you will have to have a very few, huge cavity. Whereas in microwave, you can make smaller cavities. But now that you are armed with a way to slow wave down, you can have slow wave structure. You can make cavity sizes or resonators a lot smaller than what is commonly encountered. A very good example is an LC tank circuit. This thing resonates. It resonates, but its size is much, much smaller than the wavelength. Okay, much, much smaller than the wavelength. And hence, uh, miniaturization is very important. So when you have circuit components, you can do miniaturization. Mini, sure, I think I spelled it wrong. Miniature, miniature. I think there's an A, miniaturization. So you can do miniaturization uh, quite easily uh, with circuit components without losing, without losing wave physics. But what is the downside of this? Well, the downside of using circuit component is that you have to make them out of materials. Usually in order to make things small, you might have to put in some ferrite in there and you might have to have dielectrics. Okay, you have to put in materials. Okay, but whenever you put in materials inside a component, you have loss. The downside of this is that you can miniaturize but you will have uh, components that are lossier, okay? And they, if they have lossy components, the Q is low, okay, low Q. So anything that you have to do with higher losses means that the Q of the system is going to be lower and then you cannot design narrow band structures, okay? So all these uh, engineering concerns that you have to keep in mind or be mindful of uh, when you use circuit theory to replace electromag electromagnetic theory. But circuit theory is very powerful. You can earn a good job if you learn how to be a good IC designer, okay? The industry is called ICD. IC design industry. And if you are familiar with ICD, uh, then you can find a good job quite easily. Uh, but increasingly, you have to learn about wave physics in IC design because of the frequency, okay? So let's look at the computer chip right now. If you were to look at a computer chip, it looks something like this, with transistors at the bottommost level. And then you have 
I guess now you can put uh, a few billion transistors on the chip due to the advancement in nanotechnology and due to the compounding effect of nanotechnology. You will have to learn how to engineer the system so that this signals can be taken out. So you have what you call the X and Y lines. X and Y lines are uh, crisscrossing lines uh, in this part of the computer chip where you can connect them to the transistors. The transistor has usually three pins, a PN junction, a PNP junction, or different kinds of transistor. You need three pins to take the signal out or control the transistor. And then they have to be taken out using X and Y lines, okay? And when they go to the bottom of uh, the top of the chip, this is a computer chip, okay? In the bottom of this, it can have a billion transistor, but at the top, you have ball grid array. These are called ball grid array. And they're connected to the outside world uh, by, again, very complicated package. Okay, you have a package and signals are taken out of the package. Okay, then these things are usually operating on the order of um, uh, less than three gigahertz. Okay, computer chips have not been able to go above three gigahertz for some good reason. And hence, if you look at the wavelengths at three gigahertz, I usually have this uh, rule of thumb that I remember from my undergraduate days. 10 gigahertz is three centimeters. Okay, three gigahertz, maybe it's about uh, 10 centimeters. So roughly this is, this is the thing that I used to remember uh, as an undergraduate. So when you have three gigahertz, the wavelength is 10 centimeters. And most of these structures are much, much smaller than the wavelength. So retardation effect can be ignored. And you can use circuit theory to solve these problems. And retardation effects, however, cannot be ignored on the package level because if you have a signal of three gigahertz, uh, there is some phase delay that you have to account for. And there is a very powerful simulation package called SPICE, simulation program with integrated circuit emphasis. I'm sure some of you have used this package in some of your undergraduate courses as well. And in that case, you use the node voltage method, the loop current method to convert a circuit problem into a matrix problem. Okay, you can actually learn this as an undergraduate student. And then if you have the matrix problem, you have to have solved uh, to solve matrix equations. And SPICE is a good program, a commercial program to solve a uh, matrix equation. And what I want to say is that uh, if you were to look at the SPICE program, the most advanced one, that you can find, they have put in microwave engineering components. They have put in transmission lines. There's a possibility of modeling what happens inside the computer chip. So you also have to learn about Smith charts, how to read the Smith charts. And because when you go through these transmission lines, uh, the impedances will transform themselves according to these lines on the Smith chart, which you have struggled with in your take home exam too. So Smith chart is becoming increasingly important because of the importance of retardation effects inside a computer chip. So are there any questions uh, before we end? We have two minutes left. Any questions? Okay, if not, then I'll ask you a question. Do you know the reason why the clock rate of a computer chip has been stagnated at three gigahertz and not higher. Does anybody know the reason? Well, the reason is quite simple. Actually, as an electrical engineer, you can understand the reason why, because you have, say, if MOSFET, a MOSFET can be approximated by a capacitor and then you have a voltage source, okay? You have to drive 
a billion of these transistors. So you have a simple circuit to represent the voltage source driving a transistor in this simple minded fashion. And, but all these lines are made of metal, cheap metal, so that they're not lossless. So you can actually model this slightly more sophisticatedly using something like this. Okay, say if you have a billion of these transistors that you have to drive concurrently, then what happens is that as the clock rate goes up, as the frequency goes up, okay, the capacitor looks more and more like a short circuit. The current goes up, okay? The driving current goes up. You have a current on this line, and as the frequency increases, uh, the current goes up. If the current goes up, you have something called the I square R loss. Okay, the I square R loss per each driving point goes up. And if you have a billion of this, uh, the loss is tremendous and your circuit actually gets extremely hot. So because of this, we are not being able to make computer chips that can operate above three gigahertz. The higher the frequency, the higher the current flow, the higher the driving point currents, the higher the loss you have inside the computer chip. So if one of you has a clever way to overcome this thing, then we can actually have computer chips that can operate at a higher uh, frequency and so on, okay? So are there any questions uh, before we move on? If not, I'll let you go. I'll see you at the next lecture. Okay, thank you for coming and keep safe. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Who, who is C? Who is, uh, I have this person with the name C. Who is that? Is this a person? Okay, nobody wants to admit to be a C. So, I'm Chang Yun Li. Oh, Chang Yun Li? Yeah. Okay, why don't you put your full name on the screen so that I can see who is attending classes, okay? okay. On my screen, it's all the way typed out. What? Online, it's spelled out all the way. Yeah, I can see his full name. You can see, oh, it's, it's below, sorry, because I have this put at the bottom of my screen. Yeah. Okay, C is just your... Mark short, I guess. Okay, I'll stop sharing and let you go. And you have a good day and keep safe. Okay. Thanks. You too.